Thank you all, and uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, just one correction, I'm not an associate professor, I'm a professor. Uh, so I was just, I came to, LB, to LBC to be insulted. Um, it's all right, it's okay. Um, it doesn't look like we can see the, the, um, the, the slides very well, uh, but maybe we'll dim the lights and so we can see a little better. But I just want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's important for me to be in places like this, um, particularly as I see uh, the wide range of faces, the diverse faces uh, in the audience and students. Uh, we have brothers, sisters, um, Hispanics, uh, everybody in the audience. And it's nice to be in a place that kind of looks like we think America, America should look, right? Too often or so often I'm in spaces that it is all white. Um, but that's what happens when you start doing what I do. So it's nice to, to see some of you all, the different faces in the house. Um, and today, I guess my message, I hope resonates with many of you all because you all are studying drugs and you all are trying to help people who have drug-related problems. And I suspect that, well, not you, uh, but certainly before your class, uh, many people who get drug education uh, get bullshit education. You are misled. And what I'm trying to do with high price in my work is to try and make sure that we correct that situation. Because if we don't correct that situation, one of the things that we've done in this country is that we've used the issue of drugs. The dr drugs themselves the, are sort of frightening, being frightened of the drugs. And drug policy to subjugate specific communities in the country communities of color, uh, communities who have been shut out. And so I'm trying to inform, educate the country so we can do better. Some of you all may have seen CNN special last night on opiates. I don't know if you all saw that. If you did, what you see is an exchange in ignorance. And we are going to try and correct some of that ignorance. And that's, that's what this is all about. And the talk is, I entitled the talk, How I Use Drugs to Get an Education. So education, the emphasis here is on education. And I hope that you all are using drugs to get an education. And I'll show you kind of how to do that. And then I'll tell you what it means, what it means to actually have an education and what kind of responsibility comes with having an education. In order to start, I like to, I like to start with the words of one of my favorite writers, James Baldwin, when he said that the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. Now, if you are not examining your society, you might want to get your money back because you got beat. Your education should make you want to examine your society because our society is imperfect. And one of the things, one of the responsibility of the educated person is to be able to remedy that imperfection. That's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to be in a place that's imperfect, imperfect because it allows you to make your mark. But in order to make your mark, you have to really get an education. And this is partly what we're talking about here today. What I'm talking about today is I'm going to go through a few things that I've learned along the way. A few things that I've learned in the course of writing High Price and a few things that I've learned uh, after traveling the world and promoting High Price. And one of the first things that I've learned about drugs is that we have exaggerated the effects of drugs, the harmful effects of drugs in this country. When I say we, I mean us as a country, but more specifically, I mean me, my field, as a scientist. We have participated in the exaggeration of drugs. And that's a provocative statement, and I'm going to give you some evidence for it, of course, but before doing so, I want to show you all 
how it goes down in the country. I'm going to show a short clip. I wonder, can we get any of the lights dim, or is, uh, is that just an impossible thing to do in a gym? Um, because the video won't show as well. I just have a short clip from Saturday Night Live. You know that great news organization. Um, a short clip to show you how it goes down, how we start to misinf misinform people uh, about drugs. So here's just a short clip. Okay, now we have no sound. Okay, no problem. We'll just roll with it. We'll roll with it. Since we're in California, since we're in California, we have um, one of the concerns that we have in California is methamphetamine. Um, we're concerned that methamphetamine is one of the more dangerous drugs that we have come to know in our country. In our education, this was a clip uh, about our education. And, uh, it's from the Montana Meth Project where they show a kid um, who tries methamphetamine for the first time and then engages in some unthinkable act or some abnormal act. Um, and, and, and of course, methamphetamine is to blame. Now, I just want to, uh, I want to just talk briefly about what methamphetamine is um, so we can think about this. Don't, don't even worry about it, man. It's cool. We're good. Don't worry about it. Um, so, how many of you all have heard of Adderall? I mean, this is college. If you haven't heard of Adderall, Adderall, you probably are not in college. Okay, so Adderall is Attention Deficit Disorder Medication. Um, Adderall is widely prescribed. It works for some people. Um, now, let's think about methamphetamine. The active ingredient in Adderall is d -amphetamine. When we think about Adderall, there are three amphetamines in Adderall. And only one is uh, really active in the brain, that's d -amphetamine. On the slide, what I have here is a chemical structure, the chemical structure for d -amphetamine. amphetamine. is on your left. That's the active ingredient in Adderall. And on your right is methamphetamine. And the only difference between these compounds is that methyl group, the group that circle. There's an additional methyl group of methamphetamine that makes it different from amphetamine, the active ingredient in Adderall. Now, people have said that this additional methyl group makes methamphetamine more dangerous, more lipid soluble, more addictive, you put the ad adjective on, on top, but usually more dangerous. Now, one of the things that I was interested in was studying what this additional methyl group did for human behavior. Because one of the things that I noticed is that when you go to the literature, there were some early studies in the 70s that have compared the two drugs in the same people. And at the oral administration, and what we found, or what you see, is that the drugs produce the same effects at the oral administration. And so I thought, well, maybe if you push the dose and you give the drug via another route, maybe, they, maybe you will see these dangerous effects of methamphetamine versus deamphetamine. So we did that study. Other people did similar studies. But the bottom line is that the drugs produce the same effects. So methamphetamine is essentially Adderall, it's the same drug. But that's not what your education tells you, and that's not what the public thinks about these drugs. So they are essentially the same drug. And all of those wild exaggerations about methamphetamine is just that, wild exaggeration. Now this is not to say that people who use methamphetamine don't screw up or don't engage in some behaviors that we don't find quite pleasant as a society. Because they, some people do, as do people who do alcohol or whatever. But it's not because methamphetamine exerts some unique effects. So methamphetamine and Adderall are essentially the same drug. So that's, that's, that's one of the sort of things that 
I would, I, um, one of the things that I learned about us as a science, because we participate in this exaggeration as well, how we participate in the exaggeration is that we do studies like the one here that you can't really see, but this is a, this is a brain imaging picture. This picture is someone's brain. On the left is someone's brain who never used methamphetamine, and on the right is someone's brain who has used methamphetamine. And then we tell you, an audience, that you can see the difference between those two brains, but you really can't. Because if we image, if we take a picture of all of you guys' brains, and then we compare this side of the room to this side of the room, we will find some differences. But those differences won't tell you anything about how the person is behaving because of this wide range of variability we have in humans. Now, the bottom line is that what, I'm, what I want to say about the methamphetamine story, and I'll move on, is that I have published papers where I have looked at, I have done a review of the literature and found that people who use methamphetamines, their brains look just like people who haven't used methamphetamine. That's the bottom line. Now, we didn't only exaggerate with methamphetamine, we have exaggerated the harmful effects of crack cocaine. On the slide, I have a picture of powder cocaine on the left and crack cocaine on the right. If you focus your attention back to the left, the red circle is the only difference between these two chemicals. That red circle is called the hydrochloride group. That group just keeps the compound stable such that you can't smoke it. If you want to smoke it, you have to remove that red portion or the hydrochloride portion, and now you can smoke it. But the hydrochloride portion does not contribute to the biology or the pharmacology of the drug. So the bottom line here is that crack and powder cocaine are the same drugs. It's true that when you smoke crack cocaine, the effects are more intense, more the, the onset of the effects are more rapid. That's true. But that has something to do with the route of administration, not the drug itself, because when you dissolve powder cocaine, in water and then you shoot it intravenously, it produces the same rapid onset of effects and the same intensity of effects. But it's important for us to know that as a country, we were told that these drugs were different. And then that allowed us to get crazy about our drug policy and pass some really uh, uh, stringent or draconian drug laws and this brings me to my second point. The second point is that racial discrimination has been rampant in the enforcement of our drug laws. Now we have to go back to the 1980s. This is Ronald Reagan, a picture of Ronald Reagan when he was president of the United States. He spoke to the nation and told the nation that crack cocaine was such a problem that we, it was our, one of our number one problems and we really should uh, do something about it. About the same time, the LA Times ran an article um, uh, showing that the Ku Klux Klan and the, and the NAACP were teaming up uh, to get rid of crack dealers in a black neighborhood in northern Florida. Uh, let, me, let me take a step back because I didn't hear any reaction. I, I said the Ku Klux Klan and the NAACP had teamed up. For some of you young people, they have different mission statements. <laughs> they kind of conflict. The Ku Klux Klan wanted to get rid of black people. And the NAACP, of course, they were trying to preserve and make sure the black folks were doing okay. But they kind of got together to get rid of crack dealers in a black neighborhood in Northern Florida. Does it sound like our country lost its mind. <laughs> anyway, but we were, we were losing our minds. Now, and that's, uh, uh, then we passed those, real, those laws that punish crack cocaine 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine, meaning that if you had small amounts of crack on you and you got caught with this, you were required to go to jail for a mandatory sentence of five years. It would have required you to have 100 times as much powder cocaine to get the same sentence. So we passed those laws, and one of the things that we saw 
after several years of those laws. We passed those laws in 1986, again in 1988. By 1992, the U.S. Sentencing Commission had started to study this issue about who was being arrested. And one of the things that we noticed by 1992, but their report came out in 94, was that more than 80% of the people who were arrested for these, under these laws, were black even though black people didn't make up the majority of crack users. And then when you look at places like LA County, more specifically at this time in the early 1990s, we arrested and prosecuted thousands of people under this law. You know how many of them were white? The, the year of 1990, the year of 1992, 1992 LA County, not one white person was arrested and prosecuted under these laws. So this raised some concern for people. Congress directed the U.S. Sentencing Commission to do a report. Uh, they they, they uh, directed them to reconsider the law because the U.S. Sentencing Commission are the ones that determine the penalties associated with law infractions. And when they discovered this sort of thing, they came back to the U.S. Sentencing Commission and said, we have to get rid of the disparity between crack and powder. We should treat them exactly the same. This was in 1995. President Clinton said, not no, but hell no. We're not changing this. President Clinton, along with Congress, President Clinton the reason for not changing it, he said, he said, we have to send a constant message to our children that drugs are illegal, drugs are dangerous, drugs may cost you your life, and the penalty for dealing drugs are severe. But these were not only drug dealers, of course, these were people who were caught with simple possession, but this is what, this is how Clinton justified this. Fast forward 12 years or so later, when presidential candidate Barack Obama was before Howard University's uh, giving the students an address um, when he was uh, running for president. On this issue, Barack Obama said that he thought that was wrong. He said that judges think that's wrong, Republicans think that's wrong, Democrats think that's wrong, and yet it's been approved by Republicans and Democratic president because no one has been willing to brave the politics and make it right. That will end when I'm president, is what he said. This is 2007. So the question before me and you, did it change? Well, in the Obama way, particularly on drugs, kind of. It changed such that crack cocaine was no longer punished 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine, it was now punished 10 times, 18 times more harshly than powder cocaine. So, not 100 to 1, it's now 18 to 1, right? Remember, the science, the pharmacology, says that the drugs are the same. It would be like us punishing people who smoke marijuana 18 times more harshly than those who take marijuana in their brownies. Yeah? That's fair? So, so you, you guys kind of get my point, right? Uh, it's inconsistent with pharmacology, but this is the way it is, right? So as I think about this change, I think about the words of Brother Malcolm X when he said that, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, there is no progress. The progress is in the healing, right? Especially, and I think Malcolm X's words ring even more true when you think about the situation today. Even today when we think about who's being arrested for these laws, this particular law, again, more than 80% of the people being convicted under this law are black people. Now, now I want to, I just want to make it clear, uh, I want to make this absolutely clear as we think about drugs and drug policy in our country, 
I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not new. And there are a few new things uh, for humans. There are, there are a few new things, and this is not new. So we have always, in our country, used drug policy as a way to further marginalize those on the margins. Now, we will get into talking about how even the do-gooders, people who want to do treatment and save people, even how they participate in this subjugation. But we'll talk about that in a second. But before, before doing something, I just need to make sure everybody understands uh, that people talk about the war on drugs in the United States, and they typically start with California's own Richard Nixon in 1971. That's not when the war on drugs began in this country. The war on drugs began in this country in 1914, actually before, but the first law, the first national law was passed in 1914, nearly 100 years ago. It was called the Harrison Act, and we criminalized opiates and cocaine. We tried to pass this law in 1909 with only opiates. We said that we were upset with the Chinese folks, basically, who were smoking opium, and, but the country was not really feeling. It, what the country was not in a mood to pass national or federal laws because, because we kind of believed in states' rights at that time. And so it was difficult to get a federal law for something like drugs. But fast forward a couple of years, like 1912, 13, 14, we started to see newspaper articles like this. Newspaper articles entitled, Negro Cocaine Fiends Are New Southern Menace. This was published February 8, 1914. And this is a physician who writes the article, and he had three points. Black people on cocaine were unaffected by 32 caliber bullets. You can shoot six of them into their heart, and if they were on cocaine, they would be unchecked. They would be unstoppable. This appears in this, art, in this article as well as in medical journals. That's one argument. Second argument, black people were better marksmen. Third argument, black people were more murder, murderous when they used cocaine. These arguments became compelling, certainly as it relates to passage of the 1914 Harrison Act. That's how we got the 1914 Harrison Act passed. It was insufficient to only include our sort of hate of the Chinese, so we had to have another scapegoat, the reliable Negro cocaine fiend. That's how we passed the first laws. And that set up the history for how we deal with drugs in the country. Now let's come back to today, as we think about the opioid situation, where the country is pretending to be more compassionate about opioids. And some people have talked about this issue of, now you have a white face who's using it so we can have compassion. We should have compassion, no matter what, what's the face. So that's not a problem, that's not a problem. But that's what some people are saying. But what people are less aware of is that we're saying, we're, saying, we're being compassionate on the one hand, with the white face of the opioid user. But then on the other hand, states are passing draconian laws related to opioid trafficking, like heroin trafficking, more severe penalties. That's happening in many states while we're pretending to be more compassionate. But I have a short clip. Damn, we don't have any sound. <laughs> this clip was so beautiful. Wait, hang on, hang on, Let, I'll, I'll describe it first. It's the clip where the governor of Maine, his name is LePage. He's talking to a news, he has a, he has a press conference about opioids. He's telling these people at the press conference, now I don't want to go after the drug user because the face of the drug user is the white drug user. He said he was interested only in the traffickers. He didn't say their race, but he said their names were D-Money, <laughs> Shifty, 
smoothie. Homeboy was watching too much bad TV, but, not, but we get the picture. And then if you didn't get the picture by the names, he said what's worse is that these people come to Maine from New York and from Connecticut, and then they impregnate a white woman. But that's what we do with our drug policy and the issue of drugs. We pretend to be compassionate for a certain group of people, but then there are another group of people who we have to put the hammer down. It, it, it was this, he said this a few months ago. This is 2016. It's okay if we. The governor of oh, Texas here it is. Out of state drug dealer is coming to Maine in response to a question. It's a topic he discusses at a lot of town hall forums. Here's what he said last night. The traffickers. These are people that take drugs. These are guys of the name D Money, Smoothie, Shifty. Uh, these type of guys that come from Connecticut, New York. They come up here. They sell their heroin. Then they go back home. Incidentally, half the time they impregnate a young white girl before they leave. Which is a real sad thing for them. So this is, you get the picture. And not only that, that's, that's not it, that's not it. If you go through your, if you do like a Google alert or you set your local newspapers, and you look at newspapers around the country, these are the people who are being arrested for heroin trafficking or opioid related crimes. And we're just reproducing what we did in the, early, in the mid 1980s. What we did in the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s. We're just reproducing what we did with the Negro cocaine team. New language, but same sort of behavior. And we, when we think about marijuana, we can, a place like California, you guys will vote on marijuana legalization in November and marijuana might pass, recreational marijuana legalization might pass. But even still today, we are arresting nearly 750,000 people each year in the United States for marijuana infractions. When places like Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Alaska have legalized marijuana. But what's worse is that when we look and see who's being arrested, at the state level, black people are four times more likely to be arrested than their white counterparts. At the federal level, Hispanics, I don't mean the Cubans from Miami, I, I mean uh, Mexicans from California, Puerto Ricans, New York, they represent two thirds of the people being arrested for marijuana at the federal level, even though all groups use the drug at similar rates. Now this is a clear example of racial discrimination, it's not racial bias, it's not implicit bias, it's not a disparity as we like to soften these things, it's racism. This is a clear example in case you need to know what it looks like. And when we think about marijuana, I like to think about these three names, Ramarley Graham, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland. Marijuana played a, death in, uh, uh, played a role in all of their deaths. In case you don't know who Ramarley Graham is, he was a kid from the Bronx. He was on the corner. Police suspected he was selling weed on the corner. Chased him into his home, shot him in the bathroom. Said The police said that he was trying to flush marijuana down the toilet. Killed the kid. Police was indicted, but not uh, but the case was dropped on a technicality because the jury was given some instructions that they shouldn't have been given. That guy's gone. Of course, Trayvon Martin, uh, George Zimmerman said that Trayvon was intoxicated on marijuana and so uh, Trayvon attacked him and that was his defense and it was at least in part compelling because George Zimmerman got off. And then that brings me to Sandra Bland. I want to show you just a, a quick uh, video clip of her arrest. Uh, Sandra Bland was arrested uh, for a traffic violation. A couple days later, she was found dead in her cell. The idea, the DA in this town said that she was either intoxicated during the arrest or she had snuck large amounts of marijuana into the prison, which caused her to commit suicide.
Now, I want to show you a clip of her arrest so you can see if you think she was intoxicated uh, during the arrest. It's about a, a minute long. So it gets kind of difficult. Uh, but the idea is that she, uh, statements were released that uh, she was intoxicated during the time, during this interaction, and that caused the, inter the, the interactions to escalate. Clearly, she didn't look intoxicated, but also I, 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 I uh, had her uh, toxicology and the levels. She did have THC in her system, but the levels were at placebo levels, basically. Um, um, but that, did, that didn't stop uh, uh, the DA from um, using marijuana as the possible reason for the escalation of this, uh, this interaction. And I just wanted to um, have it clear for us to see how marijuana continue, even a drug like marijuana, continues to be used as a scapegoat for some of these uh, bad behaviors of people. 